Welcome one and a welcome to all to the greatest show of them all. It is the NFC Smith Tip volume. Who cares at this point in time? Uh, football and sports are meaningless. Uh, you can listen to us on any one of SB Nation's NFC East blog podcast networks, or you can watch us on either the Bleeding Green Nation YouTube channel or the Blog and the Boys YouTube channel, where you will see myself. I'm RJ Ocho from Blog and the Boys representing the Houston Astros and himself. He is Brandon Lee Gotten representing or Bleeding Green Nation representing the Philadelphia Flyers, who I hated on when I first saw you, BLG. So Happy uh, happy Tuesday to us, and happy Wednesday to the listener. Happy first day of spring, officially. Happy first day of spring. Used to do a little tradition with my cousin, Kev. Shout out to Kev and my aunt. Short um, for Kevin or just Kev? Short for Kevin. Okay. But I, I usually just call him Kev. Uh, we used to go to Rita's Water Ice, I call it. It's now since been branded to Rita's Italian Ice, but originally it was Rita's Water Ice, so that's what I always call it. And they used to have a thing where you could just go to any location and get like a free small of any kind of ice on the first day of spring. So what we would do is we would hop around like uh, a good little portion of Bucks County there and uh, hit up like, I don't know, 10 different places and uh, try a bunch of different flavors of water ice. And that was always like a nice little playing hooky kind of thing that uh, we would do. And it worked out for me personally, schedule wise, because it's always like after the really first initial wave of free agency so things kind of like die down a little bit and then they pick back up so uh that was always fun but that's not the tangent you expected me to go on and this is episode 156 by the way or volume 156 shout out to italian ice um shout out to slushies or raspas whatever you want to call them that's um, not the same those aren't the same thing that's they're better. Aren't the same thing they're totally better um yeah. anyway um shout out to kev and your aunt and um everyone really just shout out to all humans while we're at it wow um while we're here we might as well rank the seasons so we've got mm. i guess chronologically spring summer fall and winter um i think summer's last when you're an adult falls first obviously right. now you and i are biased because you know we, our october birthdays I'm october say... birthdays our line of work you know what i mean like we're fortunate that we do things for a living that we care about you know what i mean so it all kind of blends into a fun few months around the fall i would put spring second even from a sporting perspective you know we're about to kick off the ncaa tournament we have a few weeks of that the masters you know comes right afterwards um then the nba playoffs start that takes us kind of right into the summer and that's when the dead zone starts i'd go fall spring one and two personally i think i'd go winter last i'm just not a not the biggest cold fan i know that I could maybe rectify that by moving somewhere that isn't as yeah, cold. Yeah, winter's, winter's different for you and I. So, But uh, still, it's just not my thing. Uh, I'm going to say, I guess I'll put summer over spring because I don't. spring doesn't do a ton for me. It's nice in theory, but I mean, summer, you can actually do some more fun things when it gets warm out. Now, it doesn't get too hot, and I do not like that. And I'd rather be, in theory, I'd rather be too cold than too hot because you can always you know bulk up in layers and what you can always get warmer at a certain point you really can't get cooler i mean obviously if you have air conditioning or whatever you jump in a pool sure but those aren't necessarily as easy as just putting on another layer of clothing and getting warmer last tangent we swear before we get to the football of it all we actually had a tangent prepared that you took us off in a different direction of with the uh, italian ice thing um you asked me who my nhl team was when i mocked your flyers hat and I said the Bruins, and you were really upset about this. This is fake. Um, so I was saying I never really had an NHL team growing up, although name, name a Bruins player. <laughs> well, hang on, let me explain my my position. Um, so growing up, I actually liked the Avalanche only because this is really an indication of my level of hockey knowledge. I had NHL 01, I think, for my Nintendo 64, and um. And I would use the Avalanche because the goalie's name was Patrick Roy. I know that's not his name, but uh, wow. my dad, my dad's name is Roy. And so I was just like, this is the coolest thing ever that he's got my dad's name. And so um, I obviously would go on to find out that it's uh, Patrick Waugh. Um, but, um, you know, then I grew up and kind of distanced myself from the Avalanche and that embarrassing moment. And when I went and saw the Cowboys play at New England in 2019, I don't know if you recall the game, but super rainy. Stephon Gilmore put the clamps on Amari Cooper. It really sucked. But um, my family and I, we went and saw a Bruins wild game. And I bought a Bruins cap because I wanted to have the happy Gilmore hat. 
because um, that's what he wow. wears in the movie. So um, that's my team, and it was I I forget the um, the specific details, but it was legitimately like a like they they came back in this like incredible fashion. It had like never happened before. It hadn't happened in like five hundred years or something. So um, you know, go Bruins, baby. So and uh, uh, we had just gotten Bear, my dog, uh, or my first dog, and um, and he was a little puppy at the time, and I bought him a stuffed bear. And that's his favorite toy. So we call that Boston. So, yeah. Shout out to uh to the Bruins and Boston and Bear. And a Bruin is a bear. So it all kind of worked out. Anyway, um, enough tangents. Are we good? Are we sure. tangented, tangented out? <sighs> you seem to be doing really great. <laughs> I cannot recall a time that has worn on me this much with mm. regards to the Dallas Cowboys. I think I mentioned what we do for a living that I should be celebrated among our colleagues for finding things to do last week <laughs> because y'all were all busy with your signings and your agreeing to terms and your trackers and everything like that. It was difficult, man. I mean, if you have ever been in a position where you had to make lemonade, it was me last week. So I, I deserve a medal or something, if I'm being frank. Now, the Cowboys have um, done something since we last spoke, obviously. They uh, brought in Eric Kendricks. That the only negotiation that the Cowboys have had from with, from an external free agent perspective is literally with somebody who agreed to terms with another team. So, so almost and a is matter, like directly connected, you know, to their defensive coordinator. Yeah, almost a matter of like ah, we'll give you what they will. I mean, you know what I mean. And, and it's, it's almost tax- like they forgot he was out there. It's like oh yeah, no, we wanted him. Wait, yeah, come and, come here. And it's tax free here, so you know what I mean, like. Really, we're doing you a solid, Eric. Um, Eric Kendricks, though, definitely a, an interesting player in the you know in a vacuum and the Mike Zimmer thing is certainly interesting. But that was super predictable. In fact, you know, of all the articles and things that we did prior to free agency, we we're like, well, this makes a lot of sense that Zimmer would want one of his guys, and he did get him even after he did agree to terms with the 49ers. I had a good time ripping stats about that. Also, um, the Cowboys on Friday released Leighton Vanderesh and Michael Gallup. Uh, Gallup was supposed to have a visit with the Carolina Panthers early this week, so we'll see how that goes. Leighton Vander Esch on Monday announced his retirement. Now, ESPN, in their story about Kendricks last week, they did note that it was expected that Leighton would announce his retirement. So a lot of people kind of thought this was coming, but it, it did formally happen. I um I was browsing the Eagles subreddit, and there were a lot. I was really pleased, honestly. I know that. Not everyone speaks for a fan base, but um, it was nothing but like respect and, you know, a lot of like, man, that sucks about the injuries and hope his, his life is wonderful. And uh, and somebody said, man, I feel like this dude's been in the NFL forever. And um, and he really kind of has been his coming out party really was. I know you remember it well, that game in Philly in 2018 and uh, and everything else is kind of history. Um, also on Friday night, I, that's uh, these losers, man, like they couldn't even give me a Friday night to just chill with my family. Because after a week of inactivity, that was when the Tyron Smith news dropped. Tyron, of course, heading to the New York Jets. Um, it's the end of an era. He was the longest tenured player on the team and has been the best left tackle in the NFL for a lot of his career. Obviously, that baton has kind of been, been passed back and forth between him and Trent Williams and whoever else. Obviously, there's um, Jason Peters was in that mix for, for some time, certainly. But um, it's a huge bummer. <laughs> And, and uh, I understand that the draft class is deep at tackle, but imagine not having to use that pick on the position. Um, so the Cowboys have created a number of holes. And even I know I'm just kind of vomiting everything and you can take whatever you want, wherever you want. But yeah, Tyler Smith has obviously played the position two years ago, his rookie year. But OK, cool. He's not going to be playing left guard. So what's what's your answer at left guard? Oh, by the way, your center left to Washington. Also, another player joined Dan Quinn's commanders in Noah Igbenogany. Uh, so um, it has not been a good time, to say the least, around here. Also, uh, last thing, Stephen Jones spoke um, and did so wearing a denim jacket at a PBR event at AT&T Stadium. But not the beer. In the middle of free agency. Yeah, you, I heard you get upset about that on Monday Football Monday on the SB Nation NFL show where you were talking about like Stephen Jones is over here in this jacket promoting bull riding while Howie Roseman's like, you know, trying to find like the next player that he can. Yeah, How, Howie Roseman is like, okay, if I take this comp pick and I trade it for those comp picks and then I can turn it, trade it for this and that team's going to suck based off of this projection. And they're, they're you know, they're, they were this in DVOA last year. I guarantee you Stephen Jones hasn't pulled up DVOA in like 12 years. I mean, mm. it's just. <sighs> On Eric Kendricks, uh, 
is he starting for the Cow or is he in line to potentially start for the Cowboys? I don't really know his projected role there. Yeah, he and he was on um Bustin' with the Boys. I don't know when that was recorded, but um in the aftermath of joining the Cowboys. And um he noted that I, I caught the second half of the interview. I think there was some speculation about where he was gonna play with San Francisco, and that might have led to his his, you know, um his changing right. of his mind. Um and I even saw stats his tweet when they first agreed to terms. Stats said, "There's the the bridge to Dre Greenlaw." Obviously, right. he was running the Super Bowl. Um, so Eric's point, and I think it's fair. Obviously, he was like, "I I didn't want to move and change positions and whatever." Um, so he wants to play my linebacker, and that's you know the Cowboys kind of need that. They didn't really have one. Certainly after Leighton Vanderish was hurt, they were playing on undrafted free agent safety at linebacker and Marquise Bell. So they finally have a tried and true classic, vintage, legitimate linebacker. The only other two on the team right now, if you don't count Micah Parsons, are Damone Clark, who's been serviceable, um, and DeMarvion Overshone, who was a rookie last year towards ACL in the preseason and is also a converted safety, uh, at least in college at the University of Texas. So another kind of marquee spell mold. Eric Kendrick's little brother of Eagle Super Bowl champion. Michael Kendricks, as Spelled people it know. Weird. Spelled it weird. I always thought that that was – I don't know what the story e. is. No, but wasn't it M Y C H A L? That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Y no E. So M Y C H A L. In any case, has zero interceptions, one forced fumble over the past two seasons. So not exactly, you know, making a ton of plays there. I was looking at his passer rating allowed. By the way, it's going to be in his age 32 season. Passer rating allowed over the past three years, dating back to 2021. We'll start there. 101.6, 100.3 in 2022, and then 101.8 in 2023. So not exactly, I think, the player he once was. Not saying it's an awful signing to help raise the floor. Again, you can draft players at that spot still, whatever. But um, not the most thrilling addition if it's going to be your only addition, especially. So that's real quick on him. On Tyron, uh, yeah, I mean, to what you said about being able to draft a player still, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to just – do both like you could you could bring time Ty, keep Tyron and then he's inevitably going to get hurt and then okay hey now you have this you know page to the future it just it doesn't and I think you've touched on this too it doesn't seem to line up timeline wise with what they are seemingly trying to do this year which is whether you know Jerry Jones phrasing you like it or not the all-in thing I mean they literally are in terms of Mike McCarthy they're going all in on him in terms of they're not extending him and they're really not even touching Dak's contract in a major way other than the tiny little restructure that they did. Um, so it seems just weird to me that you wouldn't be trying to retain everything you have for one last run at it and then maybe let Tyron walk next year if you're going to bring in a new coach and try to like reset the situation there. So uh, it definitely seems like a loss to me, especially too when I know you necessarily didn't. It's not like, oh, wow, Tyler Biata, she's gone. That's devastating. But still, that's two of your starters on the offensive line who are not there anymore, and that's a big deal. Things like that that are in a vacuum, maybe like 6 out of 10 on the devastating scale, are exacerbated to like an 8 out of 10 when you have such a high volume of these things. And that's why it's a big deal. And that's why nobody is mad that the Cowboys aren't signing Christian Wilkins. Like people are mad the Cowboys aren't finding serviceable replacements and they can be found on the cheap and they can be identified in places that you can turn into future assets. Um, I look at the DeAndre Swift trade as an example from Harry Roseman, who I greatly admire. Obviously, you trade for him. And I know it didn't work out and that the Eagles didn't win the Super Bowl, but he was a, I think you would agree, a, a more than serviceable player. And he got, I wouldn't even say flipped. He got, he, how he knew the market, understood, obviously, that running backs would be more valued. I don't, I may be giving him too much credit, but I think that was a good trade. He got good value. No, I, I know, that... but, but potentially understanding that the, the draft class was thin at running back this year and that DeAndre Swift sure. could be more, again, that might be That's... going a bridge too far, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'd be willing to believe it at this point with Howie. And he will turn him into a compensatory pick because that's what Harry Roseman does. Well, no, because they signed too many players, but yeah. Well, I mean, theoretically, the option at least existed is all I'm right. saying. So, but back to the Cowboys of it all. I mean, the Tyron thing, I again, in a vacuum, I understand letting him walk because of the injury concerns prior to last year. Last year was clearly an outlier, but the whole thing is exacerbated by the fact that you have all of these things happening at once. I know it didn't work out, but like, to, to the point at hand, like, why not do both? Like, the Andre Dillard thing. It didn't work out, but, like, why not draft the replacement while the dude is still on the team? And yeah. you could argue that maybe they did that with Tyler Smith, but this isn't necessarily a guard-rich draft if you're trying to find the answer at guard. 
this is a tackle rich draft and yeah great maybe you find the left tackle of the future but he's not going to be serviceable for you in 2024 which is the matter in hand the all-in thing has made all of this so much more annoying because of the national narrative and i don't blame anybody and that's what's annoying about it is jerry has to know that these kinds of things are going to be aggregated and aggregated and aggregated by myself included so i don't want to be a hypocrite but i mean that put an unnecessary um target isn't even the right word just amount of attention on the upcoming lack of moves now i glossed over the fact that dallas and dak did restructure his contract to a degree um they added two void years this broke on monday it was something they did on sunday and what's notable and significant about that is they could not have added the void years without his consent they could have just restructured him obviously had they chosen to do so uh, but the fact that dak was willing to play ball if you want to call it that I do think is representative of being some sort of olive branch um, in the name of helping the team. I definitely don't want to read too much into that, but it makes me more confident that an extension is coming. I remain frustrated that the extension, if it does come, didn't happen much earlier in the offseason. Right. But it does seem like we are on track for it to potentially land around August, like a lot of the reports <laughs> but, initially suggest. Again, that would be the most inefficient way to do this. Exactly. The what's the benefit at that point? Like, what? Well, you, what's the, the point of it? The benefit is that he's on your team. Like, that's sure, the true but benefit. Like, but you're like, not getting the max benefit of it. I agree, agree with that. Now, again, if the purpose or if the soul if the if the goal was never to be active in free agency then it's no harm no foul i disagree with that disposition well, that's, if yeah, that that's, that's a dumb goal <laughs> but i mean it, it the, also i would add that this tracks in terms of likelihood that his extension isn't coming but is at least closer than we thought it was this time a week ago because if his extension was imminent like around the corner they wouldn't have done this you know what i'm saying so, yeah exactly th so i do think the extension i, I feel more optimistic that it's going to happen which is in itself in a vacuum a very good thing but again they went about it in the most inefficient way possible and it is possible even beyond all of that just talking about possibilities or whatever that trevor lawrence gets paid or I was gonna say, the price gets paid. Is like, only going up so it yeah, might like, happen eventually and, but it's going to be more expensive when you do it then than it would be to do it now I don't think that either one of them will obviously, you know, generate the, you know the type of ridiculous quarterback money that we're used to seeing. Certainly, Tua, Trevor Lawrence has a, a a case, I suppose, but it's possible. So, like, why why would you dance like that? I mean, it's so just like a lot of other things in a vacuum, it would be okay. But the totality of it all is what is really frustrating for a lot of people. I will say that if my opinion means anything to anyone, and I've said that a lot because this these are those kinds of times. This is the most upset I've ever seen. And not just since I've been doing this professionally, but like in my life um, as a Dallas Cowboys fan that, that, you know, people have been with the team. And I, I don't know if you're laughing because like, oh, I've heard this before, but like there is a, a wide ranging sense of apathy. You have your homers and you have your people that will definitely, oh, no, just trust them. They did the same thing last year and they won 12 games, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I would say the collective opinion is that this and just to kind of wrap up, I guess the point of the team is like, it's hard to even say like, oh, they're tanking or whatever, because they're not even doing that right. And I said this last week, like, no, if, I would disagree with this, to be clear. But if you were of the mindset, like we have to strip things down, we have to start over, blah, 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 then trade CD or trade Micah or because you can't or trade fire that. the like, coach too. yeah, fire the coach. I mean, like do something that that puts you closer to flipping upside down the hourglass that you're trying to empty. Um, but they haven't done any of that. So they are just kind of floating in the ocean right now. And that's what's frustrating is there's no sign of anything anywhere. Once again, the only external free agent that they have signed is like the primary target of the new defensive coordinator who himself is a family friend and was part of a sham sort of search. You know, you know, and I, I remain on record about this, that the, the whole defensive coordinator search was was ridiculous. And they did the same thing where they threw out like an option that we they knew we would hate and Rex Ryan and Ron Rivera. And then, oh, I would much rather have Mike Zimmer than either of those options. So what they do, they hired their family friend. It all sucks. Teams do this thing in the NFL. And I think the Jaguars are actually a really good example of this from last season, especially where they get a taste of success and the incomplacency sets in and they're like, we know what we're doing because, you know, we have this result. So therefore we're smart and we're good and we like this core. And you kind of talk yourself into the 
core that you have, you know, I think kind of, you kind of romanticize it a little bit and you're like, it's this great thing and we don't really need to add more onto it. We just, we just kind of, you know, tweak along the margins a little bit, but we, we really like what we have in place in large part. So we're not going to really do too much. And yeah, I think the Jaguars are like a really good example. Now, obviously um, they, well, they had already added Calvin Ridley before even, you know, at the deadline from the what 2022 season. Right. going into last year so that was kind of made before but yeah um i think teams kind of just get complacent and i think that's kind of what the cowboys have done here and obviously there is some level of truth to yeah you know they've had success in recent seasons so it's not like they're totally inept and flying blind and have no idea what they're doing but to just sit on your hands in a division where you famously cannot win it twice in a row so easily it's very hard to do it's like it's just it kind of seems like maybe they're not really properly weighing what the, how the other teams are gaining ground on them. Um, and that could end up in a situation where once again, there's not a repeat winner. This is truly the last thing I'll say. And then we can move on to the Eagles. Um, I know that you think what you do about Dak and McCarthy, I think you would agree though, that the results from the last three years suggest overwhelmingly that they are a very solid team, right? Like in a vacuum, they haven't achieved postseason success. Nobody's disagreeing with that. Um, but that being, so like walk with me here just for the purposes of the example. Okay. So in this world where we all agree, you know, everything is perfect. Um, the Cowboys are a successful team, despite the fact by their own admission, they don't participate in free agency, despite the fact that last year's draft was awful. Okay. So there has to be some propelling factor to make them great, right? Like, so you kind of come back to like, well, you weren't active in free agency. Your draft class was horrible. It's, it probably makes sense that you have a great coach and a great quarterback, right? Like that's a logical sort of, you know, yeah, flow I get what you're saying here. So like, if that's the case, right. And, and that's a fair sort of conclusion to land on as a result of everything. Why are they both entering the final year of their contract <laughs> at this moment in time? You know what I mean? Like if if they were like, you know what? We don't need free agency because we trust the head coach. We trust the quarterback and we're comfortable putting all this pressure on them because they've delivered. They've had 12 one seasons, three years in a row. We're going to give them the extensions that they have deserved. OK, great. I still disagree with this, but at least you have some semblance of logic because it kind of points in that direction. But mm -hmm. you haven't done anything of the sort. In fact, the two people who we kind of all agree in some indirect way are most responsible for the success are the dudes you're hanging out to dry the absolute most. It's the most chaotic way to live. I, I think it's a fair point. I get what you're saying. At the same time, I mean, those two have very much underperformed in the they, biggest they have, moments which they have is the their problem. flaws but relative well, in the to biggest this, moments though like it's the worst kind of the well, worst imagine of, if they had the help of you know their front office you know adding to their roster and things like that and i'm sure. not saying i'm not saying that that is the difference but the fact that they're able to get to where they do ultimately underperforming admittedly mm -hmm. without the help of the front office from a free agency standpoint suggests that they're kind of good at this so why would you not want to help them out and give them compensation sure. that they have earned that's that's why Nothing points in any one direction. It's all dumb. It's all broken. It's all chaos. And I am so happy to move on to the Philadelphia Eagles. And I want to let you know that I thought about when the Kenny Pickett trade happened. Mm -hmm. I thought about going back and listening to our first podcast after Dallas traded for Trey Lance. Because I wanted to hear what your thoughts were. Because I, di I genuinely didn't remember. Because the situations are obviously somewhat similar. Mm -hmm. mm. But, but. They're definitely well, no, not the same. I said somewhat similar. Those are my exact words. But. I am so down on the Cowboys that I was like, I don't even care. <laughs> like I, I just do. I like even even if I if if I had gone back and found you like this clearly means that Dak sucks and all this stupid stuff. It wouldn't. Have I don't think I said that. I know, I know you didn't. But like, even if you had, it wouldn't have brought me any joy. I'm that because down you knew. Now. I mean, you and I were lockstep and like not really. I'm trying know. to point out how bad the Cowboys are if you talk about the Eagles. Just let me make the joke, please. So well, that we weren't. Like, my point was real quick, just that you know we were never really buying in. You and me, especially on Trey Lance. Because, right. you know, we would talk to stats. Cause stats stance for a long time was like, he wasn't totally wrong in the sense of if you get the right quarterback, you know, the 49ers would be like really, really, really good. And they did. But it, he picked he was, Trey to win MVP two years ago. He was, he was, he was wrong <laughs> about the quarterback. And like in a way where you should have been able to suss that out a little bit better. Anyway, the point isn't to take shots. So at stats. what was the overall compensation? Because it is kind of so, it was kind of confusing. They moved down from like what 98 to 120, I think. That's like end of round three-ish to or like mid-ish early round four. Um and they also the Eagles also gave up the two favor the most favorable of two 2025 seventh round picks. So I think the value of that ultimately came out to like a fifth round pick in terms of like the draft 
you know, pick uh, trade value chart thing. So it's not really debilitating by any means, but man, I, so, you know, let's set up the context here. Everyone knows, or at least should know that like I am probably and rightfully so like the biggest Justin Fields detractor there is. And I was higher on Kenny Pickett. I feel like then consensus. I wasn't like Kenny Pickett's number one fan, mm. but I think relative to consensus, I think I was higher on him. Um, and look, I didn't like especially know him coming at because I knew the Eagles weren't going to take a quarterback so much probably at that point. Um, possible they could have, but didn't certainly. Um, but even so, even establishing those things, it's a little tough for me to look at what the Bears got for Justin Fields, which I, by the, by the way, I think signals just how bad he is, or at least how clearly the NFL thinks how bad he is for that part of it to be true, at least. Maybe they're wrong, but they're clearly of that belief. Uh, and you're a sucker if you think the Bears had some great offer that they didn't take for Justin Fields. That's the biggest piece of propaganda I've ever seen. And like, I can't believe people are buying into that. It's pathetic. Anyway, um, it's just like Justin Fields, we at least know he can kind of like run around and make highlight plays. There's value in that, right? Like you could really do like a, a run heavy kind of attack. If Jalen Hurts has to miss some games, you could conceivably only like have Justin Fields throw the ball something like 20 times in a game, just run the ball, get him out and design so runs. Basically be Jalen Hurts is what you're saying. Like a, a lesser version of him. Sure. He can't pass. And he, the, uh, the rate of which he takes negative plays, I think is a big deal and a concern. The Eagles ultimately, I think went for the safer option, but it's just like, what is there to really hang your hat on with Kenny Pickett? Like, what does he do that intrigues you? And the only thing I can come up with is he takes care of the ball, but he also doesn't produce touchdowns. So I think the taking care of the ball thing is just because he's so risk averse that he's not turning it over, but he's also not providing points really. So uh, I can't say I love the move. And the really disappointing part to me, uh, having seen Tanner McKee last year, the Eagles picked in the sixth round and showed promise i thought in training camp and then in the preseason is that you're not really giving him a fair chance to win the quarterback two job in my estimation because if he's quarterback three the eagles practice famously so like less than other teams that there's so few quarterback three reps to go around and then when they do happen as i said to jimmy kemsky on bgn radio like they're so low quality because you have guys in there who aren't even like you know going to make the practice squad it's just bottom of the roster guys so you can't even necessarily run those reps right or, you know, it's so it's just it's really a shame to me that you would have Tanner McKee show promise and then not even give him a true fair chance. I'm assuming maybe they rotate those guys. Number two. I don't know. Um, I don't I don't hate the Kenny Pickett acquisition in that it's total nonsensical because, as I said, with Sam Howell on this very podcast recently, um, his value in terms of the salary cap is worthwhile in, in theory because you have a, a backup quarterback on a team friendly deal where he's only making like, I guess like a million or so over the next couple of years here each year. And that's actually like a lot less than again, Marcus Mariota got a 6.5 for one year. So there, there is value in having a really cheap backup. Um, but if your backup sucks really bad and isn't showing anything redeeming, well then what's the value of that? I think all that's fair. Um, now, I am not a Justin Fields hater. Like I don't hate him more than most things in life the way you do. Um, I think he's the better player, but I brought this up. You mentioned Monday Football Monday with Mark and JP. I think he's a greater threat to Jalen Hurts. Like, and, and I don't mean an actual threat, but like a greater threat than Kenny Pickett. And so like a per- the- greater perceived threat. Yeah. Well, like the moment things like if, if things don't turn around, I know we have the entire off season to go, but if it, if it's tough, like, and Mark was the one who said this well, like we've seen Justin Fields do like super exciting things in the NFL, even if you believe them to be limited, like name the Kenny Pickett highlight off the top of your no, head. I, you know? I agree. This is what and, I just said. Yeah, I and, agree. With that and part. So like it would, I think the, the, and I don't know that Jalen hurts is like a sensitive enough dude. Do I, I, I mean that. And then I genuinely don't know um, to let that bother him. But I will say like the BLG sort of code of honor is that if you are like a loser in some sense like that, then BLG doesn't like you. And I would say that Kenny Pickett kind of checks that box. Like the whole like Hmm. didn't want to suit up or whatever last week, last year for the Steelers, like kind of some big loser energy. The whole like uh, reports about him wanting out of Pittsburgh the moment they, you know, landed Russell Wilson, some big loser energy. So uh, maybe there is like a humbling process here for Kenny that he kind of needs to go through for his sake in the NFL. Mm -hmm. But I do think that the 
Justin Fields has put up with a lot. I mean, in Chicago. Now, he ha- it isn't as woe as me as a lot of people have made it sound like, uh, but he hasn't necessarily had a, a, a coach around as much as I, mean, I love Matt Eberflus. You could say the same thing about Kenny Pickett in Pittsburgh, though, if you're going to make that argument. That's now, fair. I but, think that's but, gone but too Field- far. But Fields because hasn't complained as much, at least outwardly, from a body language standpoint, things like he that. He literally has really like ripped the fans before. That one time. I mean, but that and also, one time. If, also, if you're talking about ripping fans, then are you really going to welcome back Chauncey Gardner Johnson? Because that's a whole different thing. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, no um, one disagreed with him, by the way. They're like, yeah, he's right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. Um, so <laughs> we are but, annoying. All that being said, while there are some like weird things about this, I am a big fan and I've said this many times before of the of this archetype of QB2, the young dude who has a lot of starts under his belt that if he has to start a game, it's not like his first time ever doing it. Trey Lance didn't quite check that box for me just because of the weird level of his experience and whatnot, the injury stuff. But that's why when the Cowboys signed Andy Dalton, I loved it. Like he was the ideal archetype in that sense. I talked about Gardner Minshew when how he traded for him. Yep. Kenny isn't. As, as strong of that archetype as Gardner Minshew was, I think Fields certainly would have been and is for Pittsburgh, although the conversation in Pittsburgh is obviously, is he the starter? Is he going to take over? Russ is only on the one-year deal, blah, blah, blah. So, like, I don't think you want that mess. Um, the vibes, if anything, got off with the Eagles last year. Like, this needs to be Jalen's team. No mess about it. No weird stuff. No big dom. Blah, blah, blah. So, Kenny Pickett, I think, is also somebody who helps cement Jalen's status as, like, the dude everybody loves again. I get what you're saying. I don't think that's totally invalid, but the also, and I know a lot of people disagree with this, but the NFL spoke on who they think is better at the very least. Like, I don't think, you know, they, they, they think Kenny, and it's also, there's the matter of the contract, which is again, relevant because Kenny Pickett's under team control for two more years for really cheap while Justin Fields is on the last year of this deal. Obviously no team. I mean, the Steelers are not well, going to pick up his fifth year option. That would be insane. Well, for, and that's the thing, like, obviously that's implied, but for anyone who's unaware, the Steelers have to decide in the next two months. If yeah. They and they're not going to do it. Like, and the, what, the Eagles five million. So, but that's why I was upset with the Trey Lance trade. And I wrote about this. I did a video about this because the Cowboys traded for him in not even last year in the preseason. You know what I'm saying? So like they just got not even a full off season and training camp and preseasons worth of Trey Lance. They got nothing because of when they acquired him. And so now they have to decide and they're obviously not going to do it. So at least this way, to your point, if Kenny Pickett does beat out Tanner McKee, that sucks for Tanner or whatever, but at least you get to see him in the preseason, whatever. And if something does happen, you have a whole year to decide if you want to pick up his fifth-year option, which, again, is an extreme unlikelihood, but you have more time. Yeah, there's definitely – and there's value in that. So, you know, that's part of why I think the, you know, the compensation was probably more than anyone – would have expected. I will say, going back to the point about Kenny Pickett being like a victim, quote unquote, or Justin Fields being a victim. You know, I just that is really the ultimate, like more than one thing can be true scenario where yes, the player was not surrounded by the the best supporting cast, but it's hard to then look at what Mason Rudolph did and how he was way better with the same. In conditions, other than I guess that was after Matt Canada had gone, mm-hmm. but. I mean, I just think people make – I mean, and I do think it was ridiculous how long Matt came to the state. Everyone thought that. The fact that they kept him for going into the season, everyone, I think, agreed, like, what are you doing? That was a weird and dumb move. But still, I mean, is it really, like – is it really – asking the world of Kenny Pickett to have more than 13 passing touchdowns in the whatever many games he's played. Like, that's just so few. And then I thought this was an interesting contextual point here from ESPN over the weekend after the Kenny Pickett trade. I mean, you look at the list of quarterbacks who've been traded before their third season with a team. It's not pretty, man. It's Brandon Whedon. It was Johnny Manziel. Paxton Lynch, Josh Rosen, Dwayne Haskins, your boy Trey Lance, like not not the best group to be in there. So again, uh, I'm not going to give it an F minus, but I would certainly lean closer to that than an A because uh, I just the value was so bizarre. Like to see like to give up that much. I know it's not ultimately that much, but just it felt like it was more than it should have been, which I don't think is the case in terms of how Roseman knows the, the market, but. Man, I just like Easton Stick was out there. Why can't you just sign Easton Stick, who is, I'm sure, really cheap, who worked with Kellen Moore last year and Doug Nussmeyer and has some experience? Like, he, I know you don't have the multi year thing. I know, I guess, Kenny Pickett has a higher ceiling in theory because he's younger or whatever. But man, I just, and I, I, again, I, I would have liked to see them give a legitimate chance to Tanner McKee, but apparently they're not going to do that. What was the list? Um, quarterbacks what was the qualifier there to be traded traded before before, well who didn't a new team i guess ultimately before their third season okay because you brought up brandon whedon and and he was on the cowboys but they didn't trade for him that's why i was a little bit caught up by that okay 
Oh. Yeah, whatever. Okay, well, you, you messed up, and it was really embarrassing. Season. Okay, doesn't right. doesn't change the. You're, you're making a distinction without difference. Well, I mean, the implication is that the Cowboys traded for him, and they didn't. So, yeah. well, that's what I just said. It's a distinction without any difference. Um. Okay. Do we have anything else on the Eagles other than how we continuing to? Hassan cook? Reddick trade rumors still persist out there. The Eagles pushed back his roster bonus that was due coming up here soon. So I guess that gives them more time. I mean, I, I don't want to see him off the team, so I don't. I don't love that, but I guess in theory, maybe that's just something that has to be done to make it look like the Eagles are doing everything they can in their power to find a spot for him at a fair price. But ultimately, I would just hope that they end up keeping him. Mm. And they signed Devin White. We didn't talk about that. That was a new thing from last week. So they do have a new linebacker. And I uh, tweeted about this. Um, I was in the line at Chick fil A. Just I tweeted something. I think it was like, of course, or whatever. Um, and I, all the replies I got were like, he sucks. And I'm like, I know he sucks. But what was the, hang on, what was the, the contract? Uh, it's like, it was up to 7.5, but I think it's only like something 3, 4 guarantee. I said this, I think I said it to Steven before we started recording TJ Football. But I, I don't care if he sucks. I mean, he does suck, to be clear. I, I don't think it's I, that simple. He can make well, plays. He can okay. also give up plays. But it, if the, like... The point or the like line of demarcation was like sucks or doesn't suck. He's probably in the like sucks category. And that's okay because like, you know what? I would much rather sign some dudes who might suck because they might not suck. You know what I mean? Like, even if the percentage chance is like 20%, they don't suck. At, at this point, I'm so starved for anything that like I will take anything. And so um, you, like it, it goes back to the like, you missed a hundred percent shot. I hate that quote now, by the way, like everyone who's ever seen the office has ruined it. Like we don't have to do it all the time. All right. But this is that idea that philosophy that disposition that like you should try because you never know like i i'm not saying the eagles are gonna win the super bowl but that year in 2017 there was not a single signing or any move that like i was like tory smith Pfft. you know what i mean i was like i'm not afraid of that like oh they, they're trading for jay Ajayi, you know and like all these things that like felt so inconsequential at the time they, they mattered worked. and yeah exactly and so you just and i'm not saying like oh you should just go sign any free agent ever because then it's always obviously going to work out but like you just don't know. So it's worth pursuing. And I respect somebody like Harry Roseman having enough conviction to try. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's, I don't think it's as simple as he sucks. I think that he's a flawed player, but I do think there's, uh, he's, I think he's a high variance player. So that comes with its downs that he also is capable of making plays. I think ideally, if you compare him next to a linebacker who's more like steady, that seems like a good combo to me. You have the guy who's more steady and the other guy who might give up a play, but he also might make a big play. I have one last Eagles thing. It's kind of a commander's thing, but um, I guess it makes more sense to, to bring it up here. I saw John Keim tweeting during Austin Eckler's, I guess it was a press conference, um, like his introductory one. Um, and so Austin Eckler, this is his exact tweet from Monday. Austin Eckler said part of his issues last season stemmed from ankle injuries, which makes sense, as well as a different offensive philosophy. Kellen Moore, obviously the offensive coordinator of the Chargers last year. Uh, this is the tweet continued. Said Chargers wanted more downfield throws plus downhill runs, and that mm. didn't fit his play style. So, I mean, on this, we joked about like Jalen Hurts throwing the ball, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that that's like a 100 percent indication at what the Eagles' offensive philosophy is going to be this season, but it's interesting nonetheless. I think, yeah, my biggest thing or biggest question when it comes to like, we'll see how Saquon gets involved or not in the passing game. It's really, it's more about Jalen to me. I just think it makes sense why he wouldn't be the biggest check down kind of guy because he can run. Why is he going to check down to the running back when he feels like he can just pick up those yards himself? I'm not endorsing that. I think he should check it down a little bit more, get the running backs more involved. There should be more concerted effort to do that. But I wonder how much of that is just not the player he is. Um, last thing, and I'm pulling up the exact report so I don't mess up any details. I meant to send this to you early Tuesday morning, and I didn't, so I apologize. Um, let's see here. Uh, so this is the headline from PFT. Uh, Maurice Hurst says the Browns are the Eagles opponent in Brazil week one. Um, so he was on, I don't know, do you know this? I saw this. I also saw him tweet out after the fact that he has no inside knowledge and was just reacting to Peter King saying that the Eagles and Browns would be a good week one matchup. So unless he's just trying to save face after the fact, right. uh, I guess it's possible that he just saw that and ran with it. Yeah, I mean, I bring this up only because we don't know what Deshaun Watson's situation is going to be from a health standpoint. Obviously, the NFC East plays the AFC North, obviously, as a division in 2024 um so it's possible the eagles get the browns at a more at a more vulnerable state if you 
define them to be that way without Deshaun. Um, obviously, there are mixed opinions there, but we'll see. So just wanted to. Yeah, I think it's up. possible. He's right. It's just I don't think he knows, actually. I think it's I think it's. Undecided. Are you going to go to Brazil? I don't know yet. I have to figure. I mean, got to figure that out with the company and whatnot, too, in terms of Ooh. what what uh, you know, are you doing the uh, being... the company March Madness thing? I don't even know. It, so, no. Well, you know, we kind of got all these messages about it. So maybe you should check your stuff. Mm. All right. Why don't we go to break and you check your stuff? Here we go. Welcome back. Did you check your stuff? I mean, what does that even mean? Like email? Uh, I think it was on Slack. Oh, I don't know. I'm kind of over brackets, honestly, personally. I'm not saying people shouldn't do them. I'm just like, I don't really care. Wow. Uh, I'm looking at this now. And um, actually, I don't see you being tagged. So that's my bad. Um, But I see a lot of people we work with who are tagged, myself included, including Ed Valentine. Wow. Wow. Okay. Maybe maybe they were like, for me to find out I got excluded from this. I don't care, though. I don't want to do it. Wow, that's a tough scene. Uh, I didn't mean to out you, Vox. I love you. Um, anyway, uh, the New York Giants start spreading the news. I really don't have anything. Do you have any news on the Giants that you would like to share with the class? I mean, you still have rumors out there that they're going to be trading up. So, you know, J.J. McCarthy is visiting them. Uh, would be weird to have multiple McCarthys, I guess, in the NFC East. Which, which... Also... also it would be kind of cool because, like, Big Blue, you know what mm. I mean? Like, he, he would get to kind of keep that thing. You know what I'm saying? No. What do you he's mean? Michigan. He's in Michigan. Oh. Uh, you know that, what I mean? So True. Didn't think about that. Um, that's kind of the big question there is, are they going to trade up for a quarterback? Who are they going to get? I, I could. I mean, we can very much see the Giants drafting J.J. McCarthy, right? Like That's very so, – that's very believable. This is more of an NFL draft question, but I think a lot of our listeners care about this. So we we agree that quarterbacks are going one, two, Caleb Williams and whoever else. But like, I know you're not of, of the opinion that it's Drake May, but whoever Washington's be, taking their but I'm, yeah, that's not what I'm gonna say. But right, yeah. Washington's taking their quarterback. New England is well, a bit of a question. I, I think either I don't think Washington drafts Drake, Drake May. I think I know. They either I trade literally up just to said one. that. Well, I think they either trade, but let me explain how I get there. I think they're either going to trade up to one somehow and get Caleb Williams, or they're going to take Jaden Daniels. Okay, so either way, Caleb Williams is gone at one. Mm-hmm. And do you think New England goes quarterback? I do, for the record. At number three, at yeah. that point, I think they're in the spot to trade down. I think they're going to trade down because I know they signed Jacoby, so they kind of it feels like they, you know, are they just going to ride with him really and not add? But so some, somebody is going to win the Minnesota treasure chest, right? That they're accumulating here. I think um, it's them. So it's it's either them or Arizona. So, but either so that either way, quarterbacks are going one, two, three, right? We think whether it's New England yes. taking them or whatever, and it, there's a possibility if New England takes Jane Daniels or Drake May, who doesn't go at two, that Minnesota jumps up to four for JJ McCarthy, and then and maybe the offer is so godfather like that Arizona feels like we have to move out, we have to take it, whatever. McCarthy goes four. Mm -hmm. And then Marvin Harrison Jr. goes five. So that I I brought this up because that's the like DEFCON one situation for the Giants is that all four quarterbacks are gone and Marvin Harrison Jr. is gone. So you have no real like obvious we have to do this thing. Then I think it's a matter of trading out. But like who's coming up for what at that point? Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, that's what I think. That's why I think they're really going to move up. There's been enough smoke about that that I think they're going to have to do that, especially, you know, now that they know that like the Vikings are lurking out there. Like, they're going to have to like preempt that, I feel like. But they don't have the – so Minnesota now has – the like, this the reason this conversation is important is Minnesota now has two first-round draft picks, right? They have their own, and they have uh, Cleveland's that was Houston. So they have uh, – Minnesota does uh, 23 – Yeah, but it's still a big jump down, whereas the Giants are right there at six. And the Giants also have two high seconds, I believe. So there's value in that. I know, but Minnesota has 11 and 23. I mean, I just – I think they'd have to offer more future picks. Too. Yeah, but would you rather have 11, 23, or like, I think it's like, well, who six, am I? Because that matters. Three and 30, or I forget what it is, but it's like, again, two high seconds and six. But that's why I think New England is so important here. Because if New England takes a quarterback, then Arizona is the team you have to convince, right, to trade out with you. And if I'm Arizona, I think I'd rather have 11 and 23 because I have Kyler. You know what I'm saying? I know that you don't totally believe, but like he, you have time if you have Kyler Murray here it, versus if you're, you know, 
like I don't think the Chargers are moving out. I, I cannot see that happening, especially after they have moved on from Mike Williams and traded away Keenan Allen. There's no way they're passing on Marvin. The Harris situation the you just described, it's a nightmare for the Giants. It's like a dream for the Chargers where they just sit there and then Marvin right. Harrison just falls to them right at five. Well, I don't know if you heard me um, on Monday Football Monday a few weeks ago, but you used the word propaganda earlier. The J.J. McCarthy stuff, that is the Jim Harbaugh propaganda because he's trying to get quarterbacks to go one through four so that he can wind up with Marvin Harrison Jr. And that's Probably. brilliant on his part. But my point is, if New England trades out, I think that the Giants have a shot of of, of winning over Minnesota because New England then still gets to stay somewhat hot mm-hmm. but because they, they have a more long-term future. I think Arizona's path to competing in their mindset is you know the timeline is shorter than New England's. That's why if New England takes a quarterback and you're down to the last one, I think it's much more likely that Minnesota's offer is more appealing mm. to Arizona than New York's. There's an article on this, by the way, on Big Blue View, so people can go check that out. There's a nice breakdown. But I just think there's a big difference between 6 and 11, potentially, especially depending on how you're projecting the receivers to go out. I just think that could be... Like you're you're drafting from a different bucket at that point, and I think teams would really value that six pick more than they would the eleven and the twenty three. I mean, obviously, but it depends I, on the team. Um, anything else on the Giants? I think I think they should do that. By the way, I think the Giants should trade up. They have to get a quarterback. I think they have to. Daniel Jones is not cutting it. I mean, and look, uh, if you're Dable and Shane, what are you going to do? If you don't draft a quarterback, like what what's the alternative? You're just gonna really run it back with Daniel Jones, gonna be in a spot where you know that's not good enough. He might get hurt. Um, they added Drew Locke. Okay, great. That's not really doing anything. Well, there uh, was also the report. Um, well, not a report. No, no, no. Like, but who who was it? John uh, Snyder said. John that, Snyder was the one. Go ahead. I feel like that was like almost sabotage yeah in a way. <laughs> or like it wasn't even necessarily true explain what it of, was the people who don't know so now john know. snyder basically was doing an interview i think with seattle radio or whatever and was asked or i forget exactly what he was asked but they were talking about drew Locke and part of the reasoning of like the seahawks not re-signing him or why he wouldn't have as much interest in going back to seattle was apparently reportedly that the giants were giving Drew Locke, some kind of opportunity to actually compete for the starting job with Daniel Jones, which then become became very inflammatory and then shot down by Giants slash New York reporters. So, uh, I mean, there's probably more than zero truth to that, right? Um, Drew Locke is going there with some kind of probably inclination that he can... I mean, maybe it's not... I don't know if it's going to be a matter of their splitting first-team reps, but I, my, the point being, uh, I think it's fair to say injury included that uh daniel jones is less entrenched as a starter than gino and again factoring in the fact that daniel jones gets hurt a lot too so you're, you're like that's part of the equation there is you're expecting this guy to potentially be unavailable i agree that it was somewhat of a self-sabotage or not, not self-sabotage but somewhat of a at least indirect sabotage um because now the giants are probably like dude what the hell why did you let this get out but even though drew didn't do it so drew's probably a little bit upset um, so the two like whistleblowers, I guess, relative to the NFC East right now are John Schneider and James Franklin, uh, cause he was mm. the person who, <laughs> who, um, I was checking right now where I didn't know where James Franklin was from, but he's a, he's a PA guy through and through. Mm-hmm. So I was wondering if he was like from New York or something, you know what I mean? And grew up a Giants fan. I don't know. You know what I mean? To where like he, he would have somewhat, somewhat of an incentive, um, to sabotage, but. Obviously, that's not the case. So. Yeah, I don't think the Eagles are going to get pinned for that. I think it's going to be too hard to prove, especially because, um, I don't know, how he has a track record, too, of like, I feel like getting that kind of stuff right, the little things like that. I feel like if the Eagles were awarded compensation in the Jonathan Gannon tampering, then it's fine to take something from them here, especially with the quote. But I'm, I'm again, I'm so down on the Cowboys. No I really proof. don't care. There was I, proof of the other thing. I really do not care. That's how down I am on this team. Are we ready to move on? To the, to the commanders. commanders who yeah. added a lot of players to their team in free agency. You said you really like what the commanders are doing. I like, so I want to be clear. I think the commanders are overpaying and I think the Texans overpaid to a degree. And I think the bears are kind of overpaying a little bit, um, like at least relative to like Keenan Allen's salary cap number for this year. Um, but what I like about, and this isn't applicable to Houston now, just because CJ Stroud's obviously in the NFL, but what I like about what Washington and Chicago are doing is and i said this on tgi football to be clear everyone should go listen to us every friday 
so many NFL teams put themselves in position to draft a quarterback high with like a top pick or whatever and sort of build in uh uh you know an emergency shoot or whatever because they're like well if this dude sucks we can like bail out why are you planning on this dude sucking like i'm not right. saying i'm not saying that you shouldn't have an alternative plan in an emergency case situation but like the majority of your attention and energy should be spent in the idea that he's going to be awesome because you're doing all this work with that idea in mind and so the commanders and the bears for that matter are both building their teams utilizing the rookie quarterback contract window that is smart and and so it gives you a whole extra year that, as opposed to what the texans have right now right like the texans have one fewer years to work with than these two teams because cj stroud's been in the nfl for a year and that's not like a bad thing but i respect that they're already go we use the term all in they're already doing that like that is such a cool thing to see it's a refreshing thing to see so when you're in that position people talk about overpaying and he wasn't worth this and the guaranteed money whatever the context matters. And so the context for Washington is like, if you want to bring in dudes because you think you can get there very quickly because you have a window to work with them, by all means. And I still think it's kind of weird that Dan Quinn is surrounding himself with like all these dudes that play for him with the Cowboys and all these staffers that coaches him for the Cowboys. At the end of the day, I respect that the commanders and your boy Josh Harris are giving him full autonomy over how to run this team. It's cool to see a head coach get the like total say. I'm not saying he's like the end all be all in Washington, but I'm a fan. I'm 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 not saying that like, oh, here they come. They're a playoff contender. But we've seen them contend for the playoffs in the past, like amid all the chaos. So now that, you know, everything's good and the energy is positive, I certainly could envision them being a playoff team much sooner rather than later. I think they've inarguably raised their floor. I think your what their goal was been in here in free agency isn't necessarily to find the finishing touches kind of acquisitions, which makes sense. That's not where they are. But, like, they didn't make the A.J. Brown trade, right? Like, they've done stuff that's kind of just been more about, like, filling out the roster and, like, creating a, a base, a core of players here. It kind of reminds me, I guess, a little bit like what the Eagles did in 2016 where they signed, like, Rodney McLeod. And, you know, that was the beginning of the Doug Peterson era. They're looking for, like, new members of the core to add on after the uh, cupboard had been unstocked, emptied <laughs> by Chip Kelly. So I think that's kind of where they are in their team-building standpoint. I don't think they've done anything egregious are super objectionable, but they still have a lot of work to go. I think they've, again, added players to their core, or at least could be part of this potential core here. And the more interesting thing is obviously what they do in the draft. And to bring up the Josh Harris of it all, I just was thinking about this when I, you know, I, I think there's been enough out there that like the trade up to one, I don't think that's impossible. I think they might do it. Um, and the Bears will only have to go back one pick. And we've seen this happen. Not exactly apples to apples, but Josh Harris traded up for, or at least the Josh Harris team traded up for Mar Markel Foltz when the Sixers <laughs> had the third pick. I mean, that happened. It's true. I, But I think there's something, by the way, this is a pet peeve I've been thinking about for like the past week or so. What's the point of saying there's something to be said? There's something to be said for that. Well, just say it then. Say the thing that is to be said for that thing. And if you're not saying that thing, then that means there's nothing to be said for it. So actually, if you're saying there's something to be said for that, yeah, you there's, just say there's, the thing. there's some redundancy to it. I, that's fair. Or like it's actually it means there's nothing to be said for it because if if there's actually was something to be said for it, you would just say that thing instead of saying there's something to be said for that. In any case, there's something to be said for Josh Harris being in charge of a team that was willing to be aggressive. I think can go up to the number one overall pick, and obviously you have the Cliff Kingsbury connection. And I think it's also about kind of putting a stamp on the team and being in the spotlight with this new era of ownership and head coach and everything going and GM going on there. I think there, there is something to that. And they have the ammo to do it too. They be, between the trades they've made, you know, selling off Chase Young and uh, Montez Sweat last year, like they have some of the ammo to go up there a little bit. Even if none of this works, like even if these players stink, whatever, like this has to be such a, like we talked about uh, seasons, like the first swim in the pool in the summer. You know what I'm saying? Like it has to just feel incredible just after the turmoil you've been in. And that's where like, it's fun. Like it's gotta be fun to overpay. It feels like um, uh, people are always shocked to learn. I didn't play football in high school. Did you? I, I didn't. So I mean, no, my football career was not meant to be. I signed up for uh, like football in middle school and I never got the call from wow they even didn't call a, me back they didn't even, so like it was and it was during the summer too it wasn't during wow. the school year so it was like 
okay, all these kids are going to practice and stuff. I didn't even know the thing started, so it just wasn't meant to be. Wow. Even though they knew that you would grow up to be six foot five, they still didn't want you as a part of the group. Interesting. They wanted me uh, to play for the team. They had me sign up, but then they didn't get the information to me. So, well, it just wasn't. so wow, look at us. We're just a bunch of bros who didn't play football. I talk about football. We're so stupid. But anyway, um, so like people who did or people who wrestled. I didn't wrestle in high school either. But like, you ever know somebody that like had to make weight? for something and so they yeah, like just, they just had seemed awful well it could be awful don't get me wrong but like yeah, you when, like when you spitting w- in a bottle and running around in trash but, bags in the pool sauna room no no, no 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 I'm, I'm talking the opposite end of the spectrum oh, like they had to weight? yeah they had to like make weight that they weren't at so like mm. again that could that can also be an awful thing but what i'm saying is like the commanders are kind of in that position like they sort of need to like add weight you know what i'm saying so like they're just like spending left and right and it's super it's got to be fun it's got to be cool i bet you like the people in in their building are like we have new players coming in. What? Like we we have to fit them for equipment. Like we have to change the nameplates on the lockers. Like we have to hold press conferences, and and nobody did anything illegal. This is a, a a whole different era that we're in here. So I'm very happy for Commanders fans, and I'm very jealous. And I I maintain everything I said about Dan Quinn last year that I'm starting to get really worried that his leader of menness is going to be exactly what they need. And I don't know that it's going to be like exactly what they need to like the most serious degree. But I, I am starting to buy in that this this like weird accident in terms of, um, you know, it not working out with, you know, him getting an opportunity elsewhere um, and every kind of other candidate for the commanders turning them down or whatever. It might work out that these two just kind of found each other. They truly are Rihanna's, you know, finding of love in a hopeless place, so to speak. I'm trying to think of like, you know, a different division where you know, Dan Quinn could potentially turn the commanders into that team. That's like not, you know, this Super Bowl contender threat annually, but it's like a team that you have to deal with. You know what I mean? They're a team that it's not just a, which is a graduation from like the two free wins. It's kind of felt like going into a season or at least like a guaranteed one win. You know what it kind of feels like? Maybe this isn't exactly what you're looking for. And I don't mean this apples to apples, but Dan Quinn is to the commanders what Frank Reich was to the Colts early on initially. So that makes Ben Johnson, Washington's Josh McDaniels. But the like weird kind of again, what Josh McDaniels did was horrible and awful and, and shouldn't be tolerated. But yeah, ben way jo- worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What Ben what Ben Johnson did though wasn't cool. You know what I'm saying? Like it wasn't as bad, but it was kind of like I know you're on the private jet to come see me and everything. Um, I won't be in the com, you know, in the conference room, but Aaron Glenn's going to be there and you guys can totally talk to him. Mm. Um, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it, it did feel like Washington kind of put all their eggs in that basket and had to adjust on the fly the same way that Indianapolis, again, in a much more intense and, and aggressive sense, but it worked out for Indianapolis early on. Then they became frauds and losers and narcissistic. And I was the only person who appropriately and rightfully called them out for those actions. Now Dan Quinn's kind of in that boat. So they're about to get the honeymoon bump of all this stuff. Yeah, I'm trying to find that division comparison, but I guess I can't really do it. I mean, maybe... Like a team that went from a joke of two wins to something like... Maybe Doug Peterson in Jacksonville. I don't know. I don't know. Andy Reid with the Chiefs. Early on, before the Mahomes of it all, you know? I'm just saying, I think the Commanders have this path to being... Yeah, I I still think the Eagles and Cowboys, until otherwise proven, are, you know, at the top in the division in some order. Sean McVay with the Rams. Maybe. And I think the commanders could kind of rise up and be at least this team that's kind of a nuisance. And they kind of, I mean, they have been for the Eagles, especially a little bit, but I mean, even more of a credit, like not, in the, they haven't really been that so much for the Cowboys and also in a more consistent way year in year out, as opposed to the volatility and the ceiling that they could, like they could maybe steal the division as opposed to they're not actually a factor for that. Cause they haven't been that in quite a while other than, you know, the, the, the COVID year. What would you say is the last authentically good season that Washington has had? Because 2012, sorry, RG3. I still don't think that. I mean, why? That was, why was that not authentically good? That was extremely promising for them. Do they you remember resurrected it, their season from down like what three six? They and were RG3 three. They was were three electric. and six, and, and he was electric. And he was awesome. He was okay. Fine, I'll give you that. But even that, we could kind of say they were three and. You know what I mean? They it, it took a bit of a collapse around them to win the division. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not saying that they weren't great and RG three wasn't great. He appropriately, you know, was hailed in and all sorts of things. That was but like, scary. I was like scared that he was going to be a problem for a while. I was legitimately scared, but then I immediately became way more scared in week one of chip Kelly's like five second offense. Um, <laughs> so, um, that was a crazy but, game in NFL history. Like, do you that's, remember, 
like it's, it's remember, almost like a nothing game because it doesn't really matter, but it's also it was a wild time. Do you remember the shirt that RG three was wearing um, the in their pregame warm up? Their pregame warm ups for that game. So they the played. Logo. Was it Monday? I think it was Monday Night Football Week One of 2013. Uh, it was, but uh, he was so like again the RG three stuff was like Tebow esque. Uh, that was the or, first game I ever covered for BGN. Like right for anyone who doesn't game. remember, um, RG three was wearing a T shirt that said Operation Patience, uh, despite the fact that he was mm. rushing back from the injury. But anyway, so. But so they won the division in 2012. Do you know the last time they won the division before that? Um, well, you, oh, not, uh, no, I don't know. I don't it know. Was, it was 1999. And wow. the last time they won it before that was 1991 when they won the Super Bowl. I mean, so you're talking about when they won the Super Bowl in 1991. Since then, so not counting them, they won the division, just the division, in 1999, in 2012, which admittedly took a little bit of a collapse with everything around them. 2015, when there was a huge collapse around them and Tony Romo was hurt, at least from a Cowboys slant. And 2020, when Dak Prescott was hurt and Doug Peterson decided he hated the Eagles. So, mm -hmm. wow. Um, okay, we ready to get some songs and get out of here? Yeah. Rachelle, ever the early bird, um, who gets the worm, she submitted her song last night. And she said, my song for this week is Write a Book by Maddie and Tay. I don't know if I know that. I don't either. So I know I definitely don't know it. So that's why I'm excited to listen. I have to listen to that one. What's your song? I'm going to go with, before I say mine, I would like you to send it in the chat now so I don't forget it and have to ask you later before I add it. So thank you very much. Yours? Your own song? No, no, no. Yours. I'm going to go with True Colors by Phil Collins because it does seem like a lot of people are hmm. starting to see those for the Cowboys. It's a really pretty song. We think of uh, Phil Collins a lot for the like bombastic, like poof, poof songs. Um, you know, like yeah, exactly. Or you know, um, you know, strangers like me is great from Target. He has some everybody. great songs. Oh, dude, he's the man. Have you ever seen? There's a YouTube video of him doing strangers like me in legitimately like 14 different languages. From no. when, from when they rec like recorded it for the, the Tarzan movie, so that you know it could be distributed for all the languages. It's pretty sick um, how he does that. So. Uh, but True Colors, not on the Tarzan soundtrack, but it is now a part of the NFC's mixtape playlist. A uh, lot of good Phil Collins songs include I Don't Care Anymore. I also like that one. That's, that also sounds appropriate for you. It's in thematic. You also yeah. could have picked that one. Sue Studio is also great. Um, and not Phil Collins specifically, but Invisible Touch by Genesis is also I was going to say, if you, if you yeah. include Genesis in here, you got Land of Confusion too. Yeah, um, yeah some really good, great Phil Collins songs. I'm going to go with a song that includes the lyrics and I don't want the world to see me because I don't think that they would understand when everything's meant to be broken. I just want you to know who I am. That is Iris by the Goo Goo Dolls, mm. an all-timer. Great song. A lot of great Goo Goo Dolls songs as well. This was a kind of, I mean, um, Rachel's song is uh, subject to approval by us in terms of whether it's good or not. Mm -hmm. But assuming it is, and Rachel's are always great, we pretty banging a week around here on the NFC's mixtape for this. I just saw, I would say so. I just saw <laughs> that um, Brian Burns is going to wear number zero for the New York Giants. That is the same number that Bryce Huff will be wearing for the Eagles. So we got some NFC East pass rushers. The Cowboys have yet to have a number zero. Um, really? Yeah. Losers. But, uh, but we, use we, it. It's there. I hang on. I think that Demarvion Overshone is going to wear it. Um, he didn't get he didn't get a chance to like switch to it because he got hurt. But he um his thing he wore it in college and that was his thing because his name his Twitter handle is yeah. Agent Zero. So I mean, well, also I'm, yeah, I get it. His last name has two O's on it too. That's fine. Right. Uh, so does mine. Hey, gotta bring back the double zero. Got to do it. All right. Um, as we leave, Brandon, I would like you to tell me the best food throughout spring. This isn't a summer food. It's not a winter food, not a fall food, but a great spring food that is not Italian ice. It has to be food. Well, I don't, I don't, I won't, and I wouldn't have picked that anyway. Um, I mean, yeah, just... A great food, like unique to the spring. I don't really think of like a spring There's one food. answer here, and you're gonna maybe you're what, not. What are you gonna say? Crawfish. I don't even know how that's a thing. I was gonna say you, pierogi, but have you never had crawfish? They're good any time of year. Uh, oh, no, dude. Man, this is why but I am going to the beach soon. So, Cape um, May, New Jersey, shout out. Hey, you want to know something great? Yeah, so remind me how many external free agents, um, the Cowboys have signed. One, okay. Well, did you see that there's going to be the Mike Tyson Jake Paul fight at ATT Stadium? 
Um, I, I like know that's going to be a fight. I guess I didn't know it was going to be there specifically. Yeah, so we've got that um, that has been announced. Also, the PBR thing that. Uh, Who do you think is going to win? Uh, <laughs> dude. <laughs> anyway, uh, tell me. I think Mike Tyson's going to win. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, but just announced five minutes ago, the ACM Awards are going to be held in Frisco at the Star. The American so the Cow- Country Music Awards. The, yes, the Cowboys have now announced two events that will be held at their facilities. Which is oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> this is why you need to be listening to the or watching the YouTube version. Wow! Um, um, either the Bleeding Green Nation YouTube channel or don't even. I'm not even. We're not even going to say what that <laughs> was. That's a, a visual exclusive <laughs> audio listeners um, want to check out the video to see what that. They've was. now announced announced twice as many events at their um, at their buildings than they have external free agents that they've signed. Exciting! All right. Um. Say. TGIF. 